What were Brian Jones' music plans after the split with the Stones? Brian wanted to get a new band together before he passed away. His last ever interview was with a German magazine called Bravo. At one point in the interview, journalist Thomas Bale told Brian that he thought the fans would miss him on the next Stones tour. Brian replied, you think so? Tell them I'll have my own group soon. The decision is within the next few weeks. Maybe I'll only produce music. I know one thing for sure. I want to be rich and finally rake in the big bucks. It is said that Brian contacted John Lennon Mitch Mitchell Allen Price and Jimmy Miller about intentions to put together a new band but this has never been confirmed. However, one person he got in touch with, that confirmed Brian's plans to get a new band together was Alexis Corner. Corner had been a key figure in the early 60s London blues scene. He hadn't seen Brian for quite some time but he visited him at Cotchford Farm in East Sussex, the residence formerly owned by Winnie the Pooh author A.A. A. Milne, which Jones had purchased in November 1968. In an interview a couple of years after Brian's death, Alexis Corner remembered. I was in touch with Brian again because he needed to speak to someone who wasn't worried by the business. He needed to speak to someone who could help him to reorganize his musical thinking so that he could start playing again. And he wanted to go back to the position roughly in which he was at the time when he joined the Stones, because he had played occasionally with me and he used to come around the clubs with me and so on and so forth. And he said, I'm sorry I haven't seen you for all these years. And I said, that's all right. And that's all we said about it. He really was happy at the time that he died because he was getting this new band together. We were going to rehearse it. I wasn't going to play with him. He'd asked me to and I'd said, no, I won't play with you, but I'll act as your rehearsal director because you can't sit in the band and play and stand outside it and hear what it sounds like. And I'll give up all the spare time I've got to help you to get the band together and get it on the road. But I can't perform with you full time. And he was talking very excitedly and we'd laid some tracks down of things we wanted to do. I'm not sure that he'd have made it. At the time that he died, he was sure that he would have made it and that's all that's important. At the time, one of Brian's favorite bands were Credence Clearwater Revival. He listened to Proud Mary over and over again. Another record he was listening to a lot in those days was the then latest single by the Beatles, The Ballad of John and Yoko. He was also very impressed by Johnny Winter's first album. In fact, the Stones covered Johnny Winter's song I'm Yours and I'm Hers at their concert in Hyde Park in 1969 as a tribute to Brian Jones because that was one of Brian's favorite songs before he passed away. One of the musicians who was supposed to be part of Brian's new band was Mickey Waller. Waller had played with many bands including the Jeff Beck Group along with Rod Stewart and future Stone Ronnie Wood. In an interview for Melody Maker in 1970, he said, I was going to be in Brian Jones' new band when he left the Stones. We were going to start a sort of Credence Clearwater revival thing. Mickey Waller had known Brian and the Stones since their early days when they were still playing clubs around London. In that same interview, he said, I joined the Cyril Davies All Stars but I only stayed two months. I wanted a bit of the bright lights and didn't enjoy playing all those terrible clubs, so I joined Marty Wilde and the Wildcats. I stayed with Marty a year, but while I was working with him I played with the Rolling Stones a couple of times when Charlie Watts couldn't make it. I also did a tour with Little Richard which taught me the secret of the Stones' success. I was the only white guy in Little Richard's backing group and these two guitarists played in a very weird way, very odd timing and a little out of tune. I kept wondering where I'd played with a band like that before and then realized it was the Stones. At the time, there was a blues revival going on in Britain with bands like Fleetwood Mac, when they were still a blues band with Peter Green and Jeremy Spencer, and other groups like Chicken Shack or Juicy Lucy, among others. That blues revival and the fact that Brian was listening to Johnny Winter and the swampy sounds of John Fogerty and company, seemed to suggest that he probably wanted his new band to be blues-based. Not to mention that he wouldn't have asked someone like Alexis Corner to join his band if the music wasn't going in that direction. In his book Two Stoned, Andrew Oldham, who was the Stones manager from 1962 to 1967, said, Brian had seemed to handle his break from the Stones in a remarkably sober and practical manner, at least on the surface, and I had admired this newfound aplomb from my distance. It was quite easy to understand Brian's finding inspiration in Credence Clearwater Revival, for there were parallels between him and John Fogerty that he could openly connect with and formulate a solid game plan around. There was not going back to the past of clubs, pubs and the blues circuits of the world. In that year of 1969 a return to your roots would be synonymous with failure. Credence Clearwater Revival were a good model, both in the reality of Brian's fame and his situation. 
Whether Brian realized it fully or subliminally, he and Fogarty shared not only musical but physical similarities in what they did and how they portrayed themselves. Brian could adopt the frontman persona, without competition from a lead singer's dapper diva dance ability, to get back to where he'd felt best and wanted to feel again and do it for the growing festivalistic audience who thought of him as a hero and icon. Brian could have also have felt he was entitled to find his voice. He never played me a song he'd written, so it was quite hard to know what really if he wanted to do songs with, with us that he'd written. I think he did, but he was very shy and all that, and I think he found it rather hard to lay it down to us, you know, that this was a song and it went like this. And we probably sort of didn't even think, because he didn't do it, we weren't, didn't try and bring it out of him probably. I mean, it wasn't a question of forcefully sort of stifling him. Over the years, some people have claimed that Brian Jones was a blues purist and he resented the fact that the Stones music had evolved and it was no longer straight blues and R&B. However, anyone who is familiar with the music the Stones recorded with Brian Jones knows this seems very unlikely, since one of Brian's main contributions to the band was expanding their sonic vocabulary. His use of exotic or unusual instrumentation such as sitar marimba dulcimer or mellotron, among many other instruments, gave many of those Stones songs from the 60s a unique flavor and it proves that Brian wanted the band to move forward and experiment with different sounds and influences. It seems very unlikely that he was a blues purist who wanted the Stones to keep playing straight blues and R&B numbers forever and ever. In an interview for Mojo magazine in the late 90s, Pete Townsend said, Brian and I hung out a lot from about 1964 to 1966. We used to go to a club called Scotch of St. James. We were together when we first heard I Got You Babe by Sonny and Cher. Brian was really excited and enthused by it. He loved pop music as well as R&B. That appealed to me because I hated snobbery, even though I'm sad to say I later became rather snobbish about pop versus rock. Brian Jones obviously loved the blues but he was also interested in many other types of music at the time. He became one of the pioneers of what would later be called world music when he recorded the Morocco-based ensemble The Master Musicians of Jajuka and he expressed his desire to write music in that vein when German magazine Bravo interviewed him only a few days before he passed away. At one point during the interview, Brian asked journalist Thomas Bale if he wanted to listen to some of his recordings of the master musicians of Jajuka. The journalist said, for the next 20 minutes, all I heard was flute sounds and dogs barking. Brian said, this is pure African folk music. It was recorded at night out on the street. Brian was entranced by the music. I was not. This is music, Brian said enthusiastically. I'm going to compose music in this style. Brian was also very interested in electronic music and he had expressed his desire to do an album in that vein. In an interview for New Musical Express in May 1968, Brian said, I'm very hung up on electronic music at present. If there is not room to include it on our album I would like to do something separately. Sadly, we'll never know how that new band he was putting together would have sounded and we'll never know if he would have made a blues album, an electronic album, an album full of Moroccan sounds or an album in which he merged all those different influences. We were down with him about three weeks before he died and we spent this weekend with him. Um, we are particularly glad of course now that we went, and that we were able to go because we spent an intensely happy weekend with him. probably happiest and closest weekend we'd spent with him since he was a child and of course it was in actual fact the last time we ever saw him.